It's good to see everybody. I've got a few people here in person and um, thanks for joining via Zoom as well. Um, I'm gonna start today's meeting with some staff presentations, um, starting with Adam Harris, who's here to talk about the, his Rungus research. Um, so why don't we just get started? You wanna come up, Adam? Yeah. And I will, I'm already sharing my screen, so I will just pull this up. Can you all see that presentation? Perfect, thank you. Okay, come on up, right. Adam. I'll sit over here and keep an eye. Yeah. Or and if anybody has questions, they can pop them into that Q&A chat box oh, and yeah. I can keep an eye on it too. All right. Oh, that is bright. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's all right. Um, it's nice to see everybody virtually and in person. Um, if you can't hear me, let me know and I'll try to talk louder. Um, I was just saying I haven't given a presentation or anything with a mask on, so this is going to be a new experience. Um, I have been working on this uh, Carl Rungus Catalog Raisin A project for six months now, seven months, and I thought it'd be fun to come in and share with you some of the things that I've found. <laughs> Do you all know what a Catalog Raisin A is? Okay, so it is uh, an attempt by art historians to gather together all of the works of a given artist. And so what we're trying to do to keep it somewhat simple is to just focus on Rungus's finished paintings, his landscapes and his wildlife paintings, which probably number less than a thousand. And so what we want to do is create a catalog of all of those paintings that we can find, where they are, who owned them, have reproductions of them so somebody could use our project as a resource if they ever wanted to do any research on Carl Rungus. Um, this uh, sponsorship came together for this last spring. Uh, so I wanna thank the Thomas and Elizabeth Granger Family Charitable Fund. And of course the Robert S. and Grace B. Kerr Foundation who both got on board and said, this sounds like a great, great project to do. Um, also, I wanna thank the internet because given <laughs> when this project started, I was just working at home. I wasn't going to libraries, I wasn't traveling. And so there are so many great resources um, on the net right now that weren't available when I was in grad school, for example, um, that I have uh, really relied on. Um, also, we launched a web page on the NMWA website. So you can find that under the art uh, tab. There's a little rungus, I don't think I, yeah, there it is. Um, here's a Rungus a screenshot of that. You can go on there and just read about where we are with the project. Right now, we're just kind of in the organizing ourselves phase. I have um, a great uh, person who's assisting me named Melissa, who's on the Zoom right now, and she was, has been involved with many Raisin A projects, so I'm going to be uh, relying on her knowledge and experience uh, to a great degree. So let's see. I will just dive into some other stuff. This is Rungus's first press appearance that I've found so far. It's in Forest and Stream, March 16th, 1895. And it's, if I move my cursor, can you see that? Yeah. It is not this article about skunk farming. <laughs> it is this article down here called A Moosehead, a kind of a minor blurb, but um, a nice little description you can see there. Uh, they are spelling Carl with a K, which happens uh, fairly often in this era, but he is spelling it with a C when he signs things. So this will be interesting to, for us to see as we go forward how the spelling of his name gets regularized over time. So this first mention of him came out in 1895. And remember that he comes to the U.S. in 1894 for a Maine moose hunt that fails. He decides to stay on. So he stays on and he paints in his uncle's townhouse in Brooklyn um, and ends up getting a work displayed in a gallery. And that's what that article is about. And this is the work itself. So this is sort of the, the painting that really launches Rungus's career. So I'm gonna read you a few little snippets from that blurb while you look at the painting, not look at the text, unless you'd rather look at the text. Um, all right, so there is now on exhibition at the art rooms of Nodler and Company, Fifth Avenue, not a bad address, 
an oil painting of a moose head, which ought to be seen by every big game hunter. It is the work of a young artist, Mr. Carl Rungus, which is wonderfully lifelike. It is moreover as unconventional as possible. The ordinary picture of moose head is either full face or in profile, and the most is made of the spreading antlers. So they're commenting on his, you know, positioning of the moose head, not like this and not in full profile, but at this nice little angle. And that apparently was very unconventional, unconventional at the time. And I, this is a funny line. The blurb goes on to discuss the snowy setting. And you have to remember, because it's just this, there's no imagery. So the author tries to describe it in really nice terms. And this is kind of a fun art historical sentence. The rime of frost clings to hair and antlers, and in one or two places are patches of snow knocked down from the overhanging branches in the animal's passage. I love that rime of snow. Um, and then the article goes on to say, we understand Mr. Rungus is at work on two other pictures of entire moose, uh, which will soon be finished, and the exhibition of which will be looked for with interest by hunters. Um, so this is a sporting magazine, Forest and Stream, but there's already this kind of typecast happening around Rungus that the audience for his work would be hunters, sportsmen, etc. That's going to be interesting too to see how that develops over time. So the other great thing about this moose head is that William Temple Hornaday of the New York Zoological Society sees it in the gallery and gets in touch with Rungus and that leads to Rungus being commissioned for all the big paintings that are out in Sullivan Hall. So there is, and remember last summer we had the three from Buffalo Bill and we had our three out there. Um, this is a shot of those paintings in New York at the Zoological Society. And here's our bison right here. So this moose head was a big deal. Uh, got him mentioned in the press, got him hooked up with the conservation community at the time, um, really did a lot for him. So a couple of months after the article comes out, uh, Rungus goes to a sportsman's show at Madison Square Garden, I think the first one that was held, where he meets this character, Ira Dodge, who lives out by the Wind Rivers. And Ira Dodge invites Rungus to come out here to Wyoming, as you are well familiar with. So Rungus and his uh, cousin Carl Folda travel to the Wind Rivers in 1895. They ride through Jackson Hole, ride right through here en route to Yellowstone, and then they return to New York in late November. Um, so here's our, the painting at the museum here of the Tetons that he did. He also did a painting of the Great Falls of the Yellowstone, things like that. But they came in August and they left in November. So just you know, thinking about our weather right now, they were not here in the heat of summer. They were here um, in the fall you know, to see the animals in their prime, et cetera. Um, and they did run into some snow and some weather issues, but they returned to New York with 900 pounds of trophies. So they got to, you would take the stagecoach from Cora down to Opal and get the train over. They got to Opal and built uh, huge boxes and put their trophies in the boxes. Um, Runga said of this uh, hall, it was so new to us, we collected everything. So. They really went to town on the collecting, which he didn't ever do again, but it's mentioned many times. Uh, the next uh, press clipping we have is trophies of a hunting trip in Yellowstone Park um, brought home to Brooklyn in the Brooklyn Daily Eagle in 1896. And here, over here, is a really nice engraving of Carl Rungus and his cousin Carl Fulda, the two participants in this trip. And again, I will go to a fun image while I read a little bit from this article. Uh, the article said the collection of heads, horns, skin, etc., which have been artistically arranged on a large frame comprise 11 pairs of elk horns, two pairs of mountain sheep horns, four pairs of black tailed deer horns, 20 pairs of antelope horns, five elk skins, six porcupine skins, and the list goes on and on and on. Um, the also display in the right there included some paintings uh, by Rungus and photographs taken during the trip. Um, after this display and this little bit of press attention that he got, he returns to Germany for a year in 1896. In 1897, he comes back to the US, takes another trip to Wyoming, and then by a night 1898, 
he's back in the press and really begins his illustration career. So what we've just seen is a little prelude to what would come later. This pronghorn, again, as far as I've found so far, is his first published illustration, and it comes out in Forest and Stream, March 12th, 1898. And hard on the heels, another sporting magazine recreation, he publishes this nice set of sketches in April of 1898. And when I first found these, I found them at different times. And so I said, oh, he just you know, copied this one and put it in the other magazine. But in fact, they're different enough that um, you can see he did it twice. This one's with pencil, the other one's with gouache or something. Might be the same head, might not be. It's a little bit hard to tell based on the angle. But anyway, two really nice accomplished sketches. So in 1898, he starts doing a series of wildlife illustrations for forest and stream. Um, and we'll kind of go through those and then we'll look at the other illustrations he did for recreation. Key to this is that if you can see beneath or underneath the little uh, screen there is the title and then all of these studies for forest and stream were drawn from life. So Runga saw these animals, he's you know, made studies of them, come back and then painted these great things for forest and stream. Uh, moose, bighorn, pronghorn, whitetail, and a great uh, picture called the stampede. Um, these would all have been like little supplements that would have been inserted into the magazine. So you might be able to take them out and frame them if you wanted to. Uh, they started heavily advertising these in Forest and Stream and in other related publications. This one is from Woodcraft Magazine. There's Alert up there. And here's uh, Stamp Ch the Challenge, sorry, not Stampede. The Challenge right there. They uh, advertised these, but very often they didn't say anything about Rungus in the ad. So when I was looking for these images, I would find an issue that had an illustration by him, and then I would look through the whole issue to the back and to the front to see if I could find more stuff by him. So they put out this great book. This is in 1901 with all of these uh, images. This one I couldn't find in the magazine, but they um, put it in there anyway. All these great early images from Rongus. So this is the kind of thing I've been finding wildlife wise, but he also was, uh, he was working as an illustrator. I think he needed to make some money so this, uh, for recreation, he was illustrating stories that he didn't, wasn't necessarily involved in. Uh, you can remember some other illustrators would be just given an assignment. We need you to paint a picture of this guy going down the street and he's just past a candy store or whatever. So maybe not a ton of info, maybe hadn't read the story. Um, and so I call this a learning curve. But just to give him credit, you have to remember that he was painting things like this our painting of the stampede at the time. So he knew what he was doing. But if you've gone through the Rungus Gallery with me and we've stopped at this piece, I often say he uh, obviously enjoyed painting the horse more than he uh, enjoyed painting himself. So he loved painting animals. He was not a good figure painter. Um, and that's borne out, or not a great figure painter, uh, that's borne out by some of these illustrations. This is the funniest one illustrating the weirdest story. Um, these guys were at a mining camp. Yeah, it's kind of gruesome. Uh, they're at a mining camp. The hunter who's in charge of getting food has left for the day. Um, the dogs have chased a goat onto a little pinnacle, um, but the dogs, the goat is fighting the dogs off. The men don't have a gun. So they go up and attack the goat with their axes. But because the goat's head is so solid from you know butting into other goats they can't do anything with the goat so finally apparently they wrestle the goat to the ground um cut his throat and then they have meat for the night um so this yeah really is the the weirdest one and one of his earliest uh narrative illustrations from there we have a kind of interesting story uh called surly bill about a guy who goes out and rescues this little baby from a kidnapper um, and ends up dying in the process. And then this one called Angles, which is about a guy on a squirrel hunt who has befriended 
by this little dog. And you can see for me, they get, even in this transition, get markedly better in terms of their quality. And now we move on to some more action-oriented scenes, which you don't see from Rungus all the time. This is a great one of a bucking horse. There's a bobcat or something down here and a rider has been thrown. This, uh, even better, I think, a horse bounding away from a grizzly that this guy has just been charged by and shot. And then some kind of classic, funny Yellowstone bear stories. Uh, these grizzlies have uh, gotten into the garbage box and are eating the garbage. This grizzly is climbing into the covered wagon. Um, so stories, you know, that we're kind of familiar with today. That's why we have bear boxes. And then another one, a uh, hunting scene of a hunter shooting at some bears that are attacking him. And so we go through some more hunting scenes. Also, I think Carl Rungus might have used himself as a model quite often, because that guy in the background looks a lot like the self-portrait that we have. And I wanted you to notice the perspective of these pictures, um, we are kind of behind the animal. The hunter is way back in the picture frame, sort of shooting directly towards us, which is not exactly the typical hunting uh, sort of scenario in terms of hunting pictures. Same thing here with the guys in the canoe and the moose bounding away towards us. And then even here, um, which is about Pete the dog who's chasing these sheep, the animals are running towards us and the figure is in the background. So it's a little bit of an interesting reverse perspective. If you compare it to somebody like Goodwin, um, who oftentimes does these hunting pictures, he does it more like this, where you're standing on the side of the hunter looking into the picture. And so the rifle fire or whatever's happening isn't coming straight towards you, the viewer. You're, you know, on the hunter's perspective, shooting into the canvas. Um, so it's really interesting to think about that, particularly as we look at Rungus developing and we'll see how he shifts his perspective over time. And luckily for us, you remember this uh, piece and the narrative behind it. Um, it's from that same perspective. The hunter is in the background, way back here, remember? But all you can see of the hunter in this one is a little plume of smoke, so it's not distracting, you don't have a gun pointing right at you. The hunter's back there, he's shot this elk and it caused this stampede of the other ones in the foreground. This is his first mention in the New York Times. Um, there's a nice quote right in the middle and this is New York Times. Can you move that box a little bit? I think it's 1899, Rungus had some pictures there. And anyway, it just says something nice about him. Oh, I can't. Great, there we go. There are several oil paintings by Rungus, a German artist who is considered one of the best painters of wild animals. So this is in 1899, Rungus first comes in 1894 then goes back to Germany, comes back, just starts being back in the press in 1898. So to have this mention in the New York Times by 1899, that's pretty impressive. And it shows you maybe also that he's entering into a field here in the States where um, maybe there isn't that much competition. He's really breaking new ground. Um, so this also, this kind of thread is gonna be interesting to follow as we move forward. I will, one more I've got to show you. So this is a fun discovery that I made that I still need to verify, but I found this blurb um, from Recreation Magazine in 1900, yeah, 1900, 1899. Um, and it says, if there is a reader of Recreation anywhere who has not a copy of Lachlan and Rand's desk calendar, he should lose no time in sending for one. It costs nothing, and besides being made in convenient form for daily or hourly reference, it contains a reproduction of Carl Rungus's great painting of a bull elk. This is one of our typical American wild animals, and no better picture of him has ever been made than the one which Laughlin and Rand have placed on their calendar. 
In fact, Landseer never painted a greater picture than this. Yeah, so that's another, again, pretty high praise for this young guy who's just come over and started his career in the, the United States. Um, and I've tried to find this uh, calendar and they're super hard to find. They don't come up for sale very often. And we haven't totally verified this yet, but there's no, uh, there's no Rungus signature on there or attribution to him. So we're gonna have to try to figure that out, but it makes perfect sense that um, this is what they're talking about. And again, it shows you just that difference in what he was putting out at that time between his wildlife work and his illustration work. And so I wanted to keep it brief. So that is all I brought for today. I know you guys have a packed agenda, um, but if you have a couple of questions, maybe we could do that. I think it was. I think before that it was something like rod and gun, then forest and stream, then field and stream. Um, and it's really interesting what shows up in these sporting magazines. There's a lot of uh, how to build your own yacht, uh, pick, you know, like diagrams and stuff, and not a yacht like we have today, but like a sailing boat, um, yachting, bicycling, um, how you might bike out into the woods with your gun, like gun holders on your bike, um, tennis, you know, that kind of stuff. So it, it was not just hunting oriented, especially the recreation magazine, um, with all kinds of, yeah, funny stuff like that in there. Any other questions? Feel free to drop a question in the chat box too if you're watching. Yeah. Anyway, again, it's really, oh, go ahead. Well, so kind of the, the fun moments are when you discover something. So that one right there was kind of putting pieces together, searching out what is Laughlin and Rand. I've never heard of that before. Having this pop up and say, oh, wow, that's really cool. And again, this is all, you know, on the internet. If this wasn't available, uh, I would have been just reading a lot of books, which is also great, but we've been able to make these discoveries along the way. And then also when you go through, um, I don't need to go back, but when you go through the magazines online, you're paging through them, you've found something. These aren't always credited to Rungus, but you know that he probably illustrated, had three illustrations in the thing every year. Um, so you find those and then you find an ad in the back. You say, oh, there's another Rungus uh, thing that I hadn't seen before. That's the kind of moments where you're like, oh, wow, this is really cool and really fun and um, really excited to be doing it. So one question on the chat box. Um, what's your timeline for producing this great catalog resume? It ha we have a few kind of benchmarks within this timeline, but hopefully we'll be done by the museum's 40th anniversary, which is in uh, 2027. Right? Yeah. Um, and so that would be a big Runga show, a big book to celebrate this project. The online website would be up and going with all our findings. Um, and then before that, we're hoping to do an exhibit uh, with the museum in the Netherlands that has a similar collection to ours, the Rijksmuseum in Twente. With, uh, but that would highlight Runga's Frieza, Kuner, and Lilifors, so a big four exhibit. So those are kind of our hallmarks with the, the hope of being done or in a really good state by 2027, 28, right in that time frame. Perfect. Here's a comment. I love seeing the moose head painting that launched his career in New York. Was that hard to find? I had heard about it, but I've never seen it before. No, it was not hard to find. So luckily, um, this picture, this guy, uh, Ira Dodge, and this are in the White and Heart book, which is one of the first really nice, uh, great reference books about Rungus. So those illustrations are from there. 
Did I remember that the moose picture was in there? No, but I was like, where could I find that? And then I was reading it and I found it. So that was really nice. Perfect. Thanks, Adam. Yeah, my pleasure. Uh, so Lisa Simmons is here and she is going to come up and talk to us a little bit about urban wildlife. And as a reminder, she's joining us now from Curatorial. She has left the education department, just as a refresher there in case you forgot. Um, I am going to find, here we go. I think I need to hit escape. There we go. Find your presentation. Oops, except I can't do that yet. Share screen. How do we mute this person? Or oh, get this out of here. Oh, talking. Okay. There you go. Lisa. Uh huh. All right. Let's see. Okay. Um, it's good to see everyone. <laughs> um, I'm going to talk briefly about a new exhibit, an exciting exhibit that we have uh, up now in the Wapiti through January 10th called Urban Wildlife Learning to Coexist. Um, raise your hand if you have seen this already. Okay, some of you, great. Um, for those of you who are here, I really encourage you to go and check out the exhibit after this meeting. Um, for those of you who are not here, um, who are still safely hunkering down at home, um, I have a variety of images to help you really understand what this exhibit is about, um, a closer look at some of the artwork. So um, first, uh, this exhibit could not have been possible without a partnership with Creature Conserve. Some of you may remember Dr. Lucy Spellman, um, who has spoken at this museum before, um, and Emily Poole down below um, with the green jacket on. Uh, so Creature Conserve um, brings artists and scientists together to foster informed and sustained support for animal conservation. Their programs include exhibits, scholars, including uh, exhibits, scholars, field studies, and workshops. Um, they also have a six month mentorship program that is a support system for artists, creative writers, and scientists as they collaborate and explore the human connection to nature, creating new pathways to a healthier world for all animals. Um, so amazing, um, amazing nonprofit based out of Rhode Island and Lucy Spellman here on the, uh, the right is, um, uh, has originated or created Creature Conserve. So uh, Lucy is one of 200 board certified zoological medicine specialists in the world. Um, animals have always been part of her life and her experiences with them include taking care of giant pandas in China, mountain gor gorillas in Rwanda and river otters in Guyana. She has worked as a zoo veterinarian, zoo director, wildlife vet, media consultant, writer, public speaker and educator. She has an incredible TED talk. Um, highly encourage everyone to check that out about how to save giant pandas. And she also wrote the book, The Rhino with the Glue on Shoes, which we I think maybe still carry in the shop. Um, she has been in TV documentaries, so she has a very impressive background. Um, and Emily Poole down below uh, is a natural history illustrator based in Eugene, Oregon. Her dad, Steve Poole, is vice chair of the Teton Raptor Center. So she has close connections to Jackson. She also illustrated the book, Bird Notes, I think also available in the shop, uh, made for the nonprofit radio program dedicated to the conservation of birds and their habitats. Um, so these two amazing women um, have helped to put together um, urban wildlife learning to coexist, the exhibit that is across the hallway in the Wapiti now. Um, so Creature Conserve produced the exhibit, um, but the museum helped to organize it. Um, it's, it. This is generated from the education department. So it's the education department's first um, large scale traveling exhibit um, that the museum has hosted, which is really exciting. Um, so some of you may remember the 2017 summer Wapiti exhibit called Wildlife Trade. Um, that talked about um, the global impact 
or the global trade on endangered species um, and artists were studying that impact uh, through art. Um, so uh, again, that combination of art and science in that wildlife trade exhibit, um, and again here in the urban wildlife exhibit. So um, here's a picture of the exhibit as it is installed now. Um, there are 32 artists represented in this exhibit, all living and working in the United States. Seven are from the greater Wyoming area, including uh, Susan Rose, Jocelyn Slack, Emily Poole, and some others. Um, nine are from the greater Rhode Island area, and 18 are from various parts of the, the United States. Um, and there are over 50 works of art in here, so quite a few. Uh, and you'll see a wide variety of media. Um, and this week, uh, we will be installing some sculptures from uh, the museum's collection. Uh, Steve Kestrel, um, love his work, is among, his, his work is among them, um, of urban wildlife. Uh, so stay tuned for those, uh, but it's uh, largely generated from Creature Conserve with there will be museum sculptures uh, installed this week. Oh, and the introductory panel is both in English and Spanish, something that the education department is committed to doing with all of the Wapiti exhibits. So um, the, the, one of the major themes in urban wildlife is that the line between urban and wild is often very blurred. Um, we are living day to day, especially here in Jackson, we're very int intimately aware of this, living with um, animals in this urban wildland interface. Uh, and we may take them for granted on a daily basis, but they really enhance um, the wonder of, of our lives, of our existence. Um, seeing a fox um, trotting across the road, or if you live in a bigger city, seeing a, a bird of prey roosting in a skyscraper, um, or perhaps native trout swimming in a backyard stream. These are all things that um, I know I sometimes take for granted, um, but these animals, um, their health depends on a healthy ecosystem. Um, so our, our mutually shared existence and the health of both humans and urban wildlife are, are closely intertwined. Um, and so this exhibit reminds us that our world is not um, distinct from that of the animals with which we share our home. Uh, and what if we didn't see ourselves as the dominant species in, a land, in the landscape? What if we see it as a partnership and mutually shared space? Um, so that's kind of what this exhibit is trying to do. It, it pairs artists and scientists. So uh, for many people, graphs and data, you know, numbers and hard science, it's hard to have an emotional connection to that. Um, so art really uh, helps us to connect um, to these animals in a more emotional way um, and to perhaps be moved to help um, and motivated to help protect them. Um, so that's kind of the power, powerful pairing of art and science. Um, all right, and just uh, something else to, to mention quickly, we have hosted two art science workshops here at the museum over the past three years, um, which have been very successful. Uh, so we've invited, uh, this is through Creature Conserve, we invited scientists from um, the region uh, to present their data and their research and artists translated that into um, visual art. So that was very exciting. Um, and here, uh, so I'll, I'll just briefly go over a few of the uh, works of art that are in urban wildlife uh, to hopefully entice you to come see it. Um, this first one, and this is digital media. So there's quite a few um, digital works in, in the gallery, which is exciting. Um, so this is called Blanketed. It's by an artist named Amy Chen, uh, made in 2018. Um, and so this girl in the bottom left is throwing this protective, colorful blanket over this heron um, to, to, to um, help protect it from deforestation and other issues that are threatening its survival. Um, so she says, I wanted to create an illustration that highlights um, co the conservation um, or the, uh, the issues faced by these birds and encourages people to protect these beautiful creatures. Um, so that is one. And I should say some of these artists are RISD um, students some of them are established working artists and everywhere in between. So here's a really fun one. Um, this one 
is by an artist named Mary Jane Begin. It's called Neighbor, uh, acrylic and watercolor. And she says, um, I recently bore witness to a fox trotting purposefully past my neighbor's picket fence, carrying in its mouth a very plump squirrel. Living in the suburban town of Barrington, Rhode Island, I often see wildlife existing in our midst, midst, but rarely so close at hand. The dichotomy of wild and tame struck me. My piece is meant to explore the contrast of a wild creature against a controlled, manicured environment, and ask the viewer to consider their comfort level with such a creature inhabiting not just the woods and fields, but their own backyard. Um, so there we go. And then Susan Rose, who is a, a local Jacksonite, um, this is called Potential Hazard, um, and she explores um, the, the uh, many of her pieces have to do with birds and confronting obstacles, uh, human-made obstacles um, in their daily lives, like these power lines, um, who are one of the leading causes of bird mortality. Um, so that's a piece in the exhibit. This one's really fun. Um, This is by Yisme Durkan. It's called Coyotes Among Us. Um, these two paintings were inspired by urban coyotes and their interactions with humans. Um, they imagine a representation of an ideal urban setting that has natural green spaces for humans and coyotes to thrive in. Um, Colony Collapse Disorder uh, by Sophie Tuttle um, explores um, pesticides and their impacts on, on bees um, and uh, the natural food chain. Um, and we have really cool textile art as well. Um, Sophie or Susan McMorty created this and she explores um, soil systems and um, the microbes and other um, living creatures that inhabit those systems. Uh, and we have a really cool artist bio binder um, because uh, these are emerging, um, mostly emerging artists so people can learn more about them there are websites and um, more information about the artists. So, so it's a fun exhibit. I hope you guys all get a chance to check it out. Thanks, Rachel. Yeah. It is a great exhibit. Yeah. It's really, really fun. Um, okay. Barry, as you all should know by now, was our education summer intern. And she has now joined our staff as the Associate Curator of Education and Outreach. And she's not here in person, but I think I saw her on Zoom here. Yeah, I'm here, Rachel. Perfect. Hi, Sherry. How are you? Good. How are you doing? I'm great. Okay. Am I good to go? You are good to go. Take it away. Okay. So I just wanted to come on and say a brief hello, since I know I haven't met quite a few of you in person yet. But as Rachel said, I'm Syrian. I am taking over. Lisa's old position, um, just very briefly about my background. Prior to this job, I was a writing instructor at Oregon State University and also worked as a wildlife rehabber in um, Corvallis, Oregon. So today I wanted to just talk a little bit about the app tour that I've been working on with some amazing volunteers, some of them who are here, I think today. Um, so this was in, a project that started during my internship who, where the goal was to kind of highlight some of the amazing women artists in our permanent collection, but do it in a way that really highlights them not for their gender, but for their amazing skill as wildlife artists that really explains to people why they deserve a place in our really unique collection. Um, so right now in the process, the scripts are nearly done. Um, recently, we had a new volunteer join our family at the Museum Vivian, and she is working on finishing up the last two scripts for me. So thank you, Vivian, if you are here today. Um, other than that, we are pretty much done with the writing portion, except for a few small editing snafus. So um, the artists that will be featured in this tour are Anne Coe, Lanford Monroe, Grace Carpenter Hudson, Rosa Bonner, Julie Buffalo Head, Jesse Arms Botkey, Georgia O'Keefe, Anna Hyatt Huntington, Greta Gretzinger, Gwen Merle, Sandy Scott, Sherry Salary Sander, and Shelley Reed. So a really nice mix of a bunch of different mediums. We have sculpture, we have painting, we have Greta Gretzinger's giant mural in the classroom. 
So there will really be something that I think everyone is interested in learning more about on this tour. Um, so my personal goal, because we have to have the tour done by the end of the fiscal year, is to have most, if not all, of the recording done in January. Um, and if there are any women still interested or want to be involved in the production of the app tour in some way, we are still looking for voices to do the recording for us. Um, not everyone who wrote a script was interested in recording, which I totally understand it. I think is an awkward thing to do if it's not something you're used to, but if you are interested in it, um, please feel free to reach out to me or to Rachel and I'd be happy to get you more involved in the project um, since I think it's going to be a really fun finished product. Um, that being said, I wanted to talk about really briefly a couple of other volunteer opportunities that are coming up, all of them sort of COVID dependent. Um, one of which is the app tour, um, Fables, Feathers, and Furs. We have sort of done a soft start with reinstating that program. We had one event in October. The other we kind of canceled or postponed because Jackson was in the red risk zone for COVID. But we do plan to start picking that up again, the next one being November 6th at 1030. Um, so if you are interested in getting involved again in Fables, um, I would love to work with you. And I know all the kids would really like that too. Um, I have gotten a lot of emails recently from teachers who are interested in doing field trips of some sort. I'm still working out what those are going to look like. Um, but if you have any experience with virtual museum tours or virtual programming, either that you've seen done successfully at another museum or you've been involved in producing those, I would love your help with that or even just um, just to have a brief conversation with you about your experiences with that. Um, I am looking and doing a lot of research on what that may look like for our museum who has a smaller staff. So I think volunteer help could be really essential in producing something really great. Um, and then finally, if you're interested in something that's a little less time consuming, but you still want to help help out maybe once or twice a month, um, the education team has put together a brief assessment for urban wildlife, just kind of asking people what their impression of urban wildlife is before and after they visit the exhibit. Um, and so if you are interested in collating all of that data for us, um, I would love to arrange for one of you to maybe pick up those surveys once or twice a month and just plug in those numbers for us if you are looking for something that is maybe a little bit less, um, has less in-person interaction, is a little bit more COVID safe. Um, but that's all I had today, Rachel. Um, I really look forward to getting to know all of you and working with all of you and um, coming up with more unique volunteer opportunities as we sort of work together to figure this COVID stuff out. Great, thank you so much, Sari. We're glad you're here on board. Okay, so next on my agenda was a quick hello from Pontier and it's really bright here and I don't see her out there. Is she out there? No. Um, is she on Zoom? If not, we will move forward to Jane and if she swings in, then she can say a quick hello. She just kind of wanted to reintroduce herself. Um, I do not see her on Zoom. So Jane Levino, are you there? I'm here. Hi, Jane. Hey. <laughs> Welcome to our meeting. Yeah, it seems to be going well, Rachel. Congratulations. <laughs> oh, yeah. Thanks. Good. Um, so Jane wanted to talk to us a little bit about the Art Scholarship Fundraiser. Sure. Um, please so, take it away. So yeah, some of some of the volunteers who are with us today were involved in the early planning meetings trying to figure out what this fundraiser would look like. And it's uh, as some of you may recall, what what we're coming up with is to replace the running wild event that used to be managed by the programs and events department. Um, which we're no longer doing. So that was the fundraiser. The money raised through the run, through the race, the running wild race in the summertime was used to provide 
the cash that went to the scholarship that we give each spring to a graduating high school senior who plans to continue their studies of art at the college level. And we've been doing this for a number of years now. We give a $4,000 scholarship at this point, which is really nice. So what we came up with, with your help, was that we wanted to make an art making class that would be for adults or high school through adults, I guess is what we're saying, that would um, kind of uh, serve two purposes. One, the registration fees would go towards the scholarship. Two, it's another adult education class with art making, which we had heard from you know, people wanted to see more of. We've done a little bit here and there in the past, but nothing too consistent. So what we've come up with, and then of course COVID happened, which really slowed things down because we were originally planning to have in-person art classes, sort of like what some of you may remember when we used to have the Tapas Tuesdays. We used to have on those Tuesday evenings when the restaurant was open, we had art making classes. For example, Catherine Turner came in one time and did a bear sketching class in the galleries, looking at the bear art in the collection and then inviting people to do some sketching with her in the galleries. Anyway, we've completely, so initially we were calling this sketch nights at the museum, but because of COVID, we've had to rethink that. We don't think it's a good idea this winter to have in-person gatherings of people inside the museum. So now it has turned into an online virtual art class series led by each session led by a different artist. And so what we have lined up is, I'm gonna read you the dates and the names of the artists. And what we hope is that some of you will want to take these classes and eventually we'll get you more and more involved in, in helping on the nights of the uh, programs themselves to make sure we have everything you know, lined up like materials. But essentially what it means is the artists will come to the museum and be based out of the museum classroom and perhaps go into the galleries to show some things. But all of the participants will be on Zoom. And uh, the, so it'll be an art lesson you can do from wherever you are if you, if you sign up and register to take part in these um, art making classes. So back to the schedule, we have December 8th, Wendell Field, who is a local Jackson artist, and the topic will be block printing. And then on the evening of January 5th will be Catherine Turner, and she is going to do some sketching um, lessons with gesture drawing. And then on February 9th, Andrew Neeland, who was our summer intern and who taught when he was with us for two summers, taught some um, art painting classes with senior citizens, local seniors. He's going to join us for painting wildlife portraits in acrylic. That's on February 9th. And then Jen Hoffman is our fourth artist and she will be working in pastel, teaching us pastel um, on March 9th. All of these classes take place from, let me see if I can find the time here. I think it's 6.30 to eight, is that right? 6.30 to eight, yeah. 6.30 to eight. And so you will be seeing more information coming out soon. We, again, we hope some of you will like to join us for these virtual art making classes. The artists will share a list of materials ahead of time. They will share artwork from the collection that they find relevant and inspiring to what they will be teaching. The cost will per class will be $35, or if you do all four, you save $30, and it'll be 110 if you sign up for all four. You will also have the opportunity of, um, if you can't make it in person, is what we're, it's kind of called a live virtual class, like we're in right now. Exactly. So virtual, but most of you are joining us um, most, I mean, we're in live time together, even though we're, most of us are connecting virtually today and not via the auditorium. Jane? Well, that, yeah, that's just a kind of a snapshot of what's happening, but Carrie Schwartz is creating the advertising collateral right now. So you should be seeing that soon. And then you'll be able to start signing up and hopefully be a part of this and tell your friends to be a part of it. 
and we'll start to bring in some money for the for the scholar high school scholarship, which is a great thing that the museum does each spring. Any did questions? You comment, did you have a comment, Gigi? Yeah. yeah. I just had a question. What did you say Wendell Field was doing on December 8th? Oh, I may not have said, but he's doing block yeah. printing. Rock? Block printing. Oh, block printing. Uh -huh. okay. Thank you. Perfect. Any other questions about that very exciting event? Events. Okay. Thank you, Rachel. Great. Thanks, Jane. That's awesome. We're, we're really looking forward to doing that. I think it's going to be really fun. Um, and the artists are looking forward to it as well, from what we can tell. Um, I'm thinking that right now we should just take a quick break, maybe 10 minutes. I know that's kind of awkward for people on Zoom, but maybe you all need a break too. Um, I would suggest just keeping your computer where it's at and step away if you want to. I'm going to step away for a couple minutes and then we'll come back and just kind of finish up um, maybe another half hour of stuff that I'll go through and then we'll be we'll be good for today. By now, you guys have all met most of our new employees, new staff members, um, but I did want to make a note too and remind you guys of Carrie Garner who hasn't been introduced at a quarterly meeting yet um, because our July meeting was canceled um, due to COVID. So just to, to refresh your memory, Carrie Garner is our museum shop assistant manager. So if you're here and you see her, introduce yourself, say hi. I know she's met a fair amount of you, but just wanted to mention her name again. Um, and we have been in a little bit of a hiring freeze um, as of late because of COVID and budget stuff. But I am told that we are sort of lifting that for two positions that are upcoming that we're just kind of starting getting the ball rolling on hiring for, um, which is a development associate and the supervisor of admissions and visitor services. Um, so like I said, we're not that far along in that process, but we will be hiring for those two positions. So that's good news. Um, I wanted to mention a note from the museum shop. Starting December 1st, during the entire month of December, the shop will be offering volunteers a 30% discount this year, um, which is good for one shopping trip as it has been in past years. Um, so it's 30% this year. And we hope that you will visit the gift shop and do some Christmas shopping. It starts December 1st and it runs through the entire month. Um, and then at this time, I would like to just take a couple minutes and just sort of recognize volunteers for your loyalty and your willingness um, to, to help out in what has been a really strange and difficult year for all of us. Um, even when you weren't able to be here physically, you've all been reaching out and been in contact. And I hope that you're feeling like you're still connected to the museum, even though things are strange. Um, so we really appreciate your just staying in contact with us and keeping us in the back of your mind. Um, I am sad that we weren't able to have a summer volunteer appreciation party. So I just wanted to sort of mention that, that I'm sorry we couldn't do that, but that we have not forgotten about you and we will have a party. Um, I think that when this is all over, we'll all be in the mood for a really big party. So my hopes are high for, for something great for you guys. <laughs> um, I have a message from Jennifer Tremblay. She says, I would like to express a big thank you to those who have led tours this summer and fall. I know that it's not easy to speak for an hour in a mask, but I applaud everyone who did and then signed up for more. We were able to get every tour covered and didn't have to turn any requests away. One company in particular has told me multiple times how much visitors love the tours. The work you do is invaluable and appreciated more than you know, so thank you. Um, that's huge that we didn't have to turn anyone away for a tour this summer and fall, that's amazing. I know we didn't have too many requests and they tended to be small, but thank you for dealing with that. Um, Katie was gonna say a couple of things. Um, I didn't really give her a good time to come and talk. Let me see if she's on Zoom here. Katie, are you around? I don't see her anymore. If she swings back in, um, I'll bring her up here. Um, but she just wanted to say thank you, obviously, for all of your help during Western Visions too, which again was not normal by any means, but we really made it work. And Katie really blew it out of the water. I think we all agree. Uh, she did such a great job, but she is so thankful for you guys too. Um, and so there's some bags up here for those of you that are here today, you can grab a bag with some chocolate in it um, as a thank you for working Western Visions. 
um, like I said, if she comes, if she swings back in the door, I'll, I'll pull her up here to say what she wanted to say. Um, so maybe we'll come back to her. So these COVID closures and sort of limited volunteering opportunities this year meant that I also held off on voting for a 2020 volunteer of the year, uh, which some of you have probably noticed and been wondering about. So I just wanted to mention that we will hold a more regular election next year um, and kind of call 2020 a, a little bit of a wash um, just because a lot of people just weren't volunteering that much and it just didn't seem like a, a fair playing field. Um, so in the interim, I would like to just recognize six very special volunteers that have hit a milestone of 25 and 26 years of service with the National Museum of Wildlife Art, which is amazing. Um, and so we've decided, um, myself and volunteer leadership committee have kind of talked about this. Um, and we would like to acknowledge these six lovely ladies as our 2020 volunteers of the year. Um, so they are Susan Brooks, Natalie Goss, Allison Jones, Cynthia Quast, Bobby Thomasma, and Martha Van Genderen. Um, and I have a little gift for you. Yeah, yay! <laughs> um, I have a little gift for you guys. And for those of you that are not here today, you can pick yours up from the museum or I'll mail it. Um, obviously, Cynthia can expect hers in the mail um, since she's in Chicago. And we're thinking of Cynthia as well while we're on the topic of Cynthia. She had surgery and she's, she's home. So good. So she's doing well. Yep. Fantastic. Um, so I'll awkwardly step away from the camera here since Bobby's here and Susan is here. I don't blame you here. The person will take over the table and make sure that I'm learning. So that's the goal. Let's see how it works. Let's see how my circle will be here. Whoa. Whoa. All right. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> All right, so just a couple more minutes here. Look at, see, I'm busting this out in 15 minutes. Um, just a few things to keep in the back of your mind as far as things that are coming up, um, as far as trainings and events and social things. Obviously, there's not a lot of in person events going on still at the museum. Um, first Sundays, for example, is not going to happen as normal this winter um, and this fall, but we have a, another something in the works for locals appreciation. So stay tuned on more information on what that will look like. We're very early in the planning stages there, but we will do something else to appreciate the locals instead of first Sundays. There will be a webinar coming up with the upcoming sage grouse exhibit. Um, so that will be a good volunteer training with that exhibit. And it's scheduled for Friday, November 6th at 10 a.m. Is that still correct, Jane? I think it's I think it's Friday the 6th, but at any rate, we'll have yes, I had heard that I had heard that at one time, but that was just in a meeting. But I as far as I know, that's still correct. Okay. So we'll be confirming that in the future, but just so that you're aware that we will have at least that training associated with um, with the exhibit for volunteers. There will also be another series of the Y to Y, um, the Yellowstone to Yukon series that we started last year. Um, we'll have another series of that sometime in November. I don't believe we have a date confirmed yet though. Um, there will also be a webinar coming up on the Bull Bransom winner. Normally we have the Bull Bransom um, person come and visit the schools and we usually try to have a volunteer training with that, but we're not able to do that, I don't think this year. And so we're gonna replace it with a webinar. So more details on that to come as well. Um, for social things um, with volunteers, we've had a really great year of hiking. This fall was amazing, um, but I think the weather's gonna be flipping here. So hiking is probably done and we'll start planning um, cross-country skiing, um, which I think we're gonna add a second day to the Friday date. So offer a couple different locations for people and maybe a little bit more opportunity for volunteers to join us skiing. Um, in November, we're going to do a walkthrough of Living Legends 3, which will open early in November. Is it the 7th as well? I don't have the date in front of me. Living Legends 3, new exhibit opening in November. Um, we're going to invite Carrie Wild to give us a walkthrough for volunteers um, just as a fun social event. So stay tuned on a date for that as well. And then lastly, for fun, for a social thing, I want to lead you guys in a in an activity here at the museum in the classroom 
we'll probably have to limit it to some extent as far as the crowd, but um, the classroom holds a fair amount of people. So we'll think about that. But um, I just wanna do a tissue paper painting um, for fun. It's a very easy, um, fun sort of crafty artistic thing to do together. So we will choose a Monday in November to get together and do that as well. Um, at this point, I think I will just open it up if you, if anyone wants to raise your hand or unmute and discuss anything or say anything or ask questions, concerns. Um, oh, yes. Okay. I just want to say Yeah, you're welcome. And I've had a lot of help in planning those too. So I have to give a shout out to Lori, um, Lori Bay and Ellen Sanford, who are my social helpers. So <laughs> thanks to you Ra guys. Rachel, will you repeat what she said? Because we couldn't hear it. So, yeah, we, sure. so we know what your answers were. Sure. She was she was thanking me for helping um, plan and, and do the social, the hikes and things like that. Um, they're really important to me. I know they're important to you guys too, just to have that um, just that engagement and chance to see each other. Um, so it's, it's a lot of fun and I'm glad you guys can, can do that. <laughs> yes, they are. <laughs> Anyone else have any questions, comments? Yes. Good question. Karen has asked if we're going to plan on uh, doing anything to decorate the museum for the holidays. Um, I've heard a little bit of discussion starting on, gosh, are we going to do any decorating for the holidays? And I, that's as far as I've really heard. So I think the short answer is yes, we will do some. Um, what it looks like exactly at this point, I'm not sure, but I'm sure we'll put up a Christmas tree. Um, so yeah, we'd, we'd love to have volunteer help with that. Besides the fact that it's just fun, it's a nice thing to do. So We'll, we'll plan on doing something. Rachel? Yes. Do you have a date for the training for Living Legends 3 yet? I do not. As far as the walkthrough with Carrie, I don't have a date yet. Okay. And as far as training goes, um, we'll figure that out, um, what that will look like. At this point, I don't have a date. I might have a date on a previous calendar, um, but I'd have to look back. I may have scheduled something, um, but we may have to play it by ear whether it will be in person or not. Let's see how the winter goes. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us more about sage grouse? Yeah, so the sage, the sage grouse exhibit is a photography exhibit. Um, Nap Thong, and I forget his last name. Um, so that's gonna be a big photography exhibit focusing on sage grouse. And I believe that is still scheduled to open on October 31st. So um, I had originally planned on doing some training with that exhibit at this meeting, um, but I haven't planned that um, for today. So we'll, we'll do something else for that. Um, there is the webinar that will happen um, with the sage grouse on Friday, November 6th, I believe. So that would be definitely one opportunity for a volunteer training. And if we need to do some more, we can, we can probably do a little bit more in-depth training on it too, if we need to. I'm open to that idea. Anybody else with questions, feel free to type something in the chat if you want to. Our next um, quarterly meeting is planned for Wednesday, January 20th at 10 a.m hopefully in person, but we'll see. <laughs> this worked okay, I guess, but it's just not the same. I wish you were here for a potluck, you know? <laughs> but. <laughs> All right, I don't see anybody else waving their hands wildly at me. So I think that we can probably be wrapping it up for today. 
thanks again, you guys, so much for joining this and for putting up. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank right. you, Rachel. Good to see you. You bet. We'll see you again soon. Bye, everybody. Bye.